And if you've just joined us online, welcome in. We're going to go ahead and get started in just another minute or two. Thanks for being here. Hey, good afternoon. If you joined us virtually, we're going to get started in just another minute. <laughs>
Hello. Can you all hear me online? Hi, Jessica. We can hear you. Awesome, Nick. So thank you, everyone. We're uh, just kind of getting settled here in the room. Um, it's good to see everybody. I think I think we're all here and we're going to try to get going because we, of course, have a full agenda. It's awesome to see everyone that's here in the room and and everyone online. Well, pardon me. We don't get to see them online. Um, you know, can we see the people online? Um, are we projecting the? We were working on that earlier. We'd like to be able to do that. And yes, great. And please bear with us. This is our new format here, the hybrid format, and we're um, we'll request your patience. All right, well, hello and welcome everyone. For, thank you for joining us today on Wednesday, December 7th for the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee for the Oregon Toll Program, which includes the I-205 Toll Project and Regional Mobility Pricing Project. I am Jessica Stanton, and I will facilitate the meeting today on behalf of ODOT and myself. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your commitment to this process. Let's go to the next slide, please. So as I've mentioned, this is a hybrid format. Uh, we're moving through this. So if you have any technical issues during the, the online, uh, please reach out to Nick Fazio. He sent you an email um, and he will support you with any online access or any trouble that you're having. Um, we also, if anyone has any issues in the room, please feel free to ask one of the project staff members, bathrooms, all that kind of thing. So we are hosting this meeting in person and a Zoom webinar and also a live stream on YouTube. So I will do my best to switch between people calling on members that are in the room and members that are online. And I'm gonna count on you guys to, uh, to that are online to help me make sure that I'm taking care of everyone online. So please note that this is a public meeting and observers may watch from this room or via a Zoom link or via a YouTube live stream. So it's being recorded for those who cannot attend right now and for documentation. So before we get to the main content of the, of the meeting, just want to let you know that we're taking meeting notes so we can document the conversation and our action items and our points of agreement. And I also just ask that observers who come into the room, please listen quietly. And for those, again, people that are here, the restrooms are on this floor. So please be sure to take care of yourself. If you need a break, stretch your legs, please do that. We're going to be here for the next couple of hours. Okay, um, that's great. So this is our welcome and technical info. Let's go ahead to the next slide. We have a tradition here with EMAC where we begin. Oops. Okay, there's one of those moments. <laughs> Are we good? Everyone, so everyone who has a laptop needs to stay muted. Okay, all right, got that, thank you. So we have a tradition here with EMAC that we start our meetings with a centering exercise. So why don't you just find a comfortable position in your chair, back tall, feet on the ground and body relaxed. And let's just do the opposite for the moment. So go ahead and raise your shoulders, clench your fists and just squeeze everything really, really tightly and hold it and hold your breath and release. Go ahead and place your hands on your lap and close your eyes or gently gaze downward. And go ahead and take your right hand and tap the top of your head, just gently pat the top of your head. Let's do that. Five, four, three, two, one. Put your hand back in your lap and find your breath. Just easy breath in and out. Still your mind and invite yourself to be present. Thoughts will come, easy come, easy go. 
Gentle breath in and out. Just invite yourself to have one intention to be present right now in this room. Gentle breath in and out and slowly open your eyes. Welcome back. So thank you again to everyone who is here in the room and online. Before we move forward, let's talk about our working together agreements. The Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee had put together working agreements that can be found in the committee's charter. They include listen, believe, and reflect, accept non-closure for the moment, speak your own truth with compassion, listen to understand, don't listen to respond, value and celebrate each other's experiences, open hearts plus open minds lead to exploration of possibilities, make space and then take space and be concise, bring your best thinking into the room and attack the problem, not the person, disagreement, frustration, and differences of opinion are acknowledged, explored, and addressed. Next slide, please. So our plan for today is to welcome everyone and introduce new and existing members and refresh our reasons for being here. So we'll gain a deeper understanding of EMAC's purpose, mission, vision, and accomplishments. And we'll talk about past successes and challenges. And then we'll review the EMAC 2022 to 2025 game plan or work plan. We'll share ideas and understandings for what an inclusive and successful committee looks like to us. And then we'll provide updates on the low income toll program and toll projects for the committee's understanding and questions. So that's our plan for the day. So let's see what the agenda looks like. So with that plan in mind, first we'll spend time again, welcoming and introducing everyone. And then we'll talk about where we've been, where we're going. We'll have a toll project status update and we'll hear from members of the public in public comments. And then we'll talk about our go forward plans. So that's our agenda. Okay, so now we're here. So I'm super happy to say welcome and let's introduce each other to, to ourselves. And I think what we'll do is we'll start with the members that are here in the room and then we'll move to the members online. So um, our, I see a finger being pointed towards someone. <laughs> so do we have a volunteer to uh, begin their introduction? Is that, is that, are you pointing to Phil at Eduardo? Oh, I was just suggesting we go that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about if we, do you want me to call on someone or does someone want to be brave and volunteer? I can, I can jump in here. There you go. I've Thank unmuted. you, Eduardo. Uh, well, good evening. It's good to be uh, back in person. I'm very excited for this part two of the EMAC. Uh, my name is Eduardo Ramos, and I am a member at large. Uh, I like to proudly state that I bring the bi-state commuter perspective. I live in Southwest Washington, but I proudly serve uh, the communities of South Washington County uh, in my role at uh, Metro Regional Governments. But I am very uh, excited to welcome uh, our new members and uh, welcome back our uh, longtime members. It's been almost three years, I think. So with that, I will hand it off to the next person. And I'm just going to pause for a moment. Thank you so much for that introduction, Eduardo. Um, I There was one other slide that we wanted to talk about uh, to just give you some pointers on things that you can share with us. Um, you can let us know what brings you to EMAC. What aspirations do you have for working with EMAC? And then anything else personal or professional that you'd like to share with the committee. And we're going to pull this slide down, but that, that those discussion points are in your handout if you want to kind of remind yourself about what those discussion points are. So with that said, Eduardo, was there anything else that you would like to share? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll yield my time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a, a, a tremendous amount of work, good work that has been done in the last uh, three years. And, uh, you know, my focus has been 
of course, being a champion, I think like many of our members, a champion for uh, working families, the middle income earners uh, throughout the region. Uh, and again, just contributing that by state perspective, we've gotten a good uh, foundation. So now looking forward to that next phase, getting a little more technical and uh, continuing to listen to the people of the region. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Would you like to go next, Bill? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Phil Wu. Um, and this is my second time around with Emac since I was on Emac 1.0. Uh, first of all, I'll say that I'm wearing a mask because I've got a, a bad cold, which I'm convinced is RSV. Uh, and I don't want to give it to anyone else just to confuse your uh, personal journey through winter time. Uh, I've tested negative four times in the past four days for COVID, so I feel very comfortable with that. But nevertheless, it's no fun to have a bad cold. <clears throat> anyway, so having said that, um, you know, I come to EMAC, uh, I think, from, from three different perspectives. Uh, one is uh, from the standpoint of health, since transportation is a pretty significant determinant of health. My background is um, in the healthcare industry. I'm a retired pediatrician from Kaiser Permanente. So that's number one. Number two is um, from the aspect of uh, climate mitigation and transportation, of course, is the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and is the number one uh, lever that we have for impacting uh, climate change. Uh, I happen to be the board president of the Oregon Environmental Council, so I've got a very strong vested interest in, in uh, that outcome. And then third is, of course, equity. And that's, of course, that's part of our name, EMAC, is Equity Mobility Advisory Committee, and making sure that the work of ODOT and especially around congestion pricing uh, takes into account uh, all of our different communities and uh, all of the disparities uh, that exist. I'm hoping that uh, with this round of EMAC that we actually do have a significant impact on the policy decisions that go into congestion pricing from all of those three perspectives, you know, health, equity, and climate. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Hi, I feel no problem sitting next to Dr. Phil Wu with his mask on. I just want to make sure we go public there. I'm Rachel Winslow. I am an at-large member. I am a policy historian of the transnational United States in the 19th and 20th centuries and have done a lot of research in the areas of social policy as it affects um, race and families uh, with the primary focus on immigration. So that is my own interest in the questions that we're asking in the present. William Faulkner has this really famous quote. I always love pulling out the literature guy from the South because I feel like that makes me seem like I'm very liberal artsy. But um, <laughs> but he says um, that the history that we have is the present is not even past, right? History is not even past. And I think about that a lot. Um, I was just talking with Garrett yesterday on the phone and we were discussing the Bracero program in the 1940s, something I talked to my students a lot about that actually built the communities, right, of Hillsborough and Woodburn. And history is not even past, so it matters in the conversations we have now, in the decisions that we make, and we can learn from the stories in the past to inform our policies right now. So I'm excited to be part of the committee for that reason. That's great. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Burgess. I'm the executive director for Fourth Plain Forward, um, which is the district association in Vancouver City that uh, is a small two and a half, uh, two and a half square mile area, holds around about 21,000 folks and um, hugely marginalized communities, uh, systemically disadvantaged for, for many, many years. And um, we have a large population of Hispanic uh, community members, a large population of Black African American, Latino, um, uh, Asian and uh, Pacific Islanders. And so we have these, these these large systemic issues in that area. We're very obviously very close to the I-5, very close to, to Oregon. There's a lot of uh, people that travel and traverse across um, across the river on a daily basis. 
And so really for me, it's about how we work with and for our community and bringing community first into all the work that we do at our association. Um, I'm currently in the throes of transforming from a district association to a community development corporation with the real intention of really looking at how we broaden out um, our workforce development, our economic opportunity for the community, but also really considering and contemplating those social determinants of health, really thinking about the climate impact that this, that's happening right now. Um, and so for us as an organization, um, it's it's critical that we have a voice at the table for, for these sort of uh, involvements um, and looking up at what happens um, at the broader spectrum um, for our community members as they, you know, as we grow over the next few years. And so for me, really critical to be here to, to voice their concerns and to be to be their voice and um, obviously listening to them as we move forward as well. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of why I'm here. Thank you. How can I go after that? Um, <laughs> I know. My name is LaQuinta Daniels, and um, I come to you. I have a background of working in juvenile justice. Um, I was a probation counselor for a number of years, the Clark County Juvenile Court, and currently I serve as a program coordinator of their restorative community service program. And what brings me here to EMAC is, um, for me, I hold a passion for just working for uh, working with our population of youth, so at risk youth and their families, mm. and recognizing that with tolling, it's going to affect a lot of them. Um, also, currently as a Washingtonian, and I also reside and live in Washington, um, I have colleagues who um, make that commute back and forth across the bridge. You know, some work in Washington but live in Oregon, and then vice versa. And so, just bringing those layers and um, to this table. Um, I also have lived experience living in the uh, Midwest. You know, tolling was a part of life. It was just how we did things. And so moving here, just seeing that we're now moving into that phase, just happy to be here and bring my many levels of experience. So that's all. Thank you. And why don't we go to uh, John? Good afternoon, EMAC. I too am an alumni from version 1.0, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Gardner. I am the chief equity officer for TriMet. Um, so I'm wearing the climate, the uh, equity and the uh, public transit had in these conversations and just want to continue the amazing work of the first round of folks that brought a lot of really good ideas and policy to the table and ensure that specifically when it comes to public transit, we're considered not just a mitigation, but an investment partner in terms of recognizing more riders require more services and more resources. So just want to make sure that's done in an equitable fashion. So looking forward to getting to know the new members and reacquainting with the uh, of rest of the alumni, I won't say old members. <laughs> Thanks, John. Hi there, uh, Michael Espinoza here. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and let's, I was also part of EMAC 1.0, so I'm happy to, to be back. Um, I'm a member of the um, Active Transportation and Safety Division at the City of Portland and the Bureau of Transportation. Um, and one of the uh, projects I was involved um, there was called the Pricing Options for Equitable Mobility Task Force. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, I pull a lot of experience from because in that space, there was a lot of discussion around the role of pricing in our transportation system and um, you know the opportunities um, and challenges of using pricing as a tool to um, shift behavior change, uh, but also understanding that that generates revenues and that can be strategically reinvested um, into a system that works for everybody. Um, and I think that's also just really grounded in that the place we're starting from right now is not equitable. And so, you know, as we make changes and 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 as tolling is rolled out, there's a chance um, to really change our system there. So that's like, you know, that's what um, I'm excited to work on um, and be here for. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. So I think we've captured all the members here in the room. So why don't we go to Adam? Would you like to say, introduce yourself? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can, perfectly. Okay, great. Well, it's, um, it's my pleasure to be part of this conversation, part of this committee. I am one of the new EMAC members. Um, I attended one of the onboarding sessions, but this is my first EMAC meeting, so it's pleased to meet those of you who I have yet to meet virtually uh, in a virtual setting. I did want to be there in person, but I had 
another work commitment here in Oregon City. I reside in Oregon. I work in Oregon City for Clackamas County. Um, what brings me to EMAC is uh, kind of a long answer, but I'll try to make it as short as I can. Um, my background is in public policy. Uh, as a graduate student at the University of Texas in Austin, I worked as a program planner in both environmental uh, planning and public health, um, focusing a lot on community engagement, leading with equity, um, community engagement in water quality planning in South Texas, but most recently in COVID response here in Oregon. Um, a lot of the folks I work with have been um, folks who are systemically not included in conversations um, for government accountability, um, folks like migrant seasonal farm workers. So a lot of the uh, aspirations that I have are to uh, help design a process and government um, uh, procedures that are uh, transparent, accountable, and involving uh, the public as most as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really happy to be here and I'm excited to move forward with everyone. Thank you, Adam. Why don't we move to Amanda? Hi everyone, I'm Amanda Garcia Snell. Um, she, her pronouns, I'm the Community Engagement Manager of Washington County in the Office of Equity, Inclusion and Community Engagement, uh, which is part of the County Administrative Office. And I am also, uh, or as others have mentioned, I'm part of um, EMAC First Gen 1.0, olden days, I don't know what we're calling ourselves. Um, uh, and um, equity is a, a critical component of this project. And so uh, that's um, part of why I'm at the table. I also have a background in public health and, um, and, uh, and have worked in a lot of active transportation areas as well. So all, all of the things that are related to EMAC and, um, and important considerations. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Um, how about Tangerine? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, perfect. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tangerine Beheri, um, new EMAC member, and I work for Right Connection. Uh, for those who are not aware, we are a private nonprofit uh, that provides transportation in the tri-county area, mainly in Washington and Clark uh, Washington and Multnomah County. Uh, we serve a lot of disadvantaged population. Uh, my my um, the reason I I am interested in EMAC is from a transit point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, we are public transit, but we we are different in the sense that we have our staff but we also have volunteers that help us provide the transportation. So it's kind of a little different then. Um, so happy to be a part of this group. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. And Jeff. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? We can. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeff Christian. Um, uh, this will be my first both sides meeting with EMAC, um, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I recently became aware, actually, uh, of this committee uh, through my leadership where I work at Columbia Distributing, and that would be why I'm here. Um, Columbia Distributing is a, uh, it's a for-profit company that is primarily logistics and uh, serves as a logistical resource for like contained beverages. But what that really means is that uh, we're a logistics organization that operates pretty much over the entirety of Oregon and Washington. And we have roughly 70% of our staff in um, uh, warehousing or trade positions. And I-5 specifically is a lifeline, not only to our business, but we have hundreds of people that commute from Salem to Portland, various areas around Portland. So uh, I'm the uh, HRCP over at Columbia for Oregon, and um, my leadership knows that I have a, a, a pretty um, deep-rooted passion in uh, trying to make the playing field a little bit more level uh, in general for society. And um, so I'm coming into this from the perspective of, uh, I represent a great number of uh, 
regular everyday working individuals, many low income and many who rely very much on transporting themselves from Salem to Portland, vice versa, and all around the area. In addition to the business actually moving product all over the place, but that's less of a concern for me than the individuals. Thank you, Jeff. So I think that, is that all the members? I think we've covered all the members. I think we have Fabian uh, oh. online, Jessica. Oh, great. Fabian, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Um, yeah, of course. Um, hi, everyone, Fabian. And I'm also a alumni from the um, EMAC 1.0. And yeah, so I, I, I joined because I really wanted to be a part of um, making sure that we were advising ODA on, on how to implement an equity framework so um, the most vulnerable communities were not harmed and, and to ensure that, you know, the funds that um, were gathered were also invested into the communities um, as well as, you know, um, just ensuring that, right, that in order to have an equitable transportation system that we it would have to be one that was creating opportunities and so yeah that that was a huge part of why you know i'm, I'm back as well is um to continue with the great work that um this team and and odot has has been doing on on these sewing projects so great to see you fabian and everybody online um i think the only the last member would be commissioner smith if you just want to do a quick hello, and I know we'll spend some time hearing from you later in the meeting too. Great, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm uh, on the commission, um, Oregon Transportation Commission, and I'm the liaison to this committee. And I think what I'm hoping that we will accomplish is the continuation of the great work that EMAC One started, which is guiding ODOT in decision-making through an equity lens. And that will help the, the commission achieve their strategic action plan goals of centering equity in everything we do, making sure that we are making decisions um, that take into account past harms and uh, make sure that we are listening to everyone who is impacted and particularly those who have been historically um, underrepresented. So this work is instrumental in guiding ODOT and the OTC in making decisions that take into account and reflect everyone's, everyone's perspective. So thank you all for all your time and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. So I think what we'll do is I'd like to turn it over to Mandy to reintroduce herself and welcome the committee. Great, thanks, Jessica. Um, I'm Mandy Putney. For those of you that I haven't met before, it's a pleasure to meet you today or to re-meet you if we've met in the past. I'm ODOT's uh, Strategic Initiatives Director with our Urban Mobility Office um, and have a great um, pleasure of being able to work with both of the tolling project teams. Um, welcome back or welcome to new members. We're very excited to continue to move forward with EMAC as we continue developing our toll program and the toll projects. Um, this next phase of EMAC, um, I think we have we have to settle EMAC 2, we put EMAC 2.0, um, we'll figure out the name, um, really will continue to influence and inform our implementation and project development. Um, and I greatly appreciate your time that you've already spent and the time that you'll spend, um, you'll spend moving forward in participation on this committee. I um, am going to share a brief version of uh, kind of my version of Emacs history from ODOT's perspective, how it came to be uh, my role and provide some input on other resources available to you um, as a committee as you move forward with your work um, with our project teams. Um, we, we began uh, this toll program development with a, with a goal of creating an equitable tolling system. And we wanted to um, have some help along the way. We knew that this tolling in general was something that ODOT hasn't done before. 
um, and tolling and equity aren't words that are often paired together as we're looking um, elsewhere. Um, and so we, we wanted to bring together a dedicated advisory committee to help us achieve this goal. Notably, we wanted a new committee um, and a different sort of committee, one that was really composed of community experts uh, where lived and professional experience regarding equity and mobility um, would be represented around the table. We had this idea of what we wanted, this new goal for an equitable tolling system, and we started to do our research. Um, so we looked at other programs around the country for information and lessons learned. Um, much of this has been shared with EMAC in the past. Um, we worked on developing our internal team structure um, so that we'd have um, equity experts as well as public involvement and engagement um, and ur urban planning resources available. We knew that we uh, were going to have to think critically about um, how to boost up the work that the committee would do um, and who would help achieve us um, help us achieve different outcomes, both in terms of process um, and project development for our toll program. So we do now have a, a dedicated team of equity strategists um, available to help the committee and to help the toll projects. They advise the toll projects on an ongoing basis um, as we move forward. Um, along with EMAC's guidance, all of this infrastructure led to the development of the equity framework, which is a tool that we're using with our NEPA process and our project development. As many of you know, we, we were um, trying to convene EMAC um, as a committee. COVID hit, <laughs> uh, we had the pandemic. Shortly after that, local, national um, scene really changed with uh, an increased um, attention to social and racial justice um, and protests happening. Um, these historical events helped shape the context of the committee's work um, and it making it even more critical and timely um, as we're thinking about uh, ODOT specific um, needs and requirements. So. Um, despite or in, uh, along with all of these things, uh, the, I think it just makes the accomplishments of EMAC even uh, more significant. Um, everyone has had uh, a lot going on in their lives <laughs> over the past couple of years, and we know that we've asked a lot. Um, so really do appreciate um, the work that many of you referenced uh, during your introductions. Since the inception of EMAC, I've had multiple roles with ODOT, um, but I was around as EMAC was being um, developed and considered um, a part of the team that helped create the foundation for EMAC. Um, and now I'm working more closely both, as I mentioned, with the I-205 toll project and the regional mobility pricing project. Um, so I oversee the NEPA or the the environmental analysis that's underway for both of those projects um, and oversee the team, both of the teams that are involved in that. Um, as an urban mobility office director, um, EMAC is now falling under my area of responsibility. Um, many of you that were here in the past work directly with uh, Lucinda Broussard, the former toll program director, um, and she was the link with you, the Urban Mobility Office and ODOT in this committee, and I will um, play part of that role now moving forward. Um, we do have robust project teams. They're at your disposal um, in terms of analysis and research and information, um, and I'm deeply invested in continuing to help you be successful as a committee. Um, you'll continue to meet uh, with many of the project team members and leaders as we move forward. You'll hear from some of them today. Um, and I just mostly want to say thank you. Your work really is vital. It's been vital to get us to this, this point today. Um, working directly, I think, with, with Commissioner Smith and the, um, the full commission uh, to bring the agency um, moving us forward really in a, in a place um, that I don't think would be possible without your work. Um, so it's been a number of years already. We're asking for more time, um, but I hope you see the fruits of your labor um, and that it really is uh, directly influencing the projects. So thank you for being our partners in equity mobility. Um, and uh, with those remarks, I'll pass it over to Erica McAlpine, ODOT's Assistant Director for the Office of Social Equity. Um, and she's on the screen. Thank you, Mandy. 
As Mandy said, I'm Erica McAlpin. I am the um, Assistant Director for the Office of Social Equity and Chief Equity Officer at ODOT. And I want to um, be a part in, and be involved with this committee to just help elevate your voices within uh, the agency and make sure that you are heard and the ideas that you have kind of permeate throughout the agency. Uh, we appreciate the service that you are providing to EMAC and to UMO on this very important project that will impact all Oregonians. And I just know that we are here to hear, to listen and learn as well as take action on the ideas that you bring to the table. Thank you so much, Mandy and Erica. Um, they are our leaders and partners in this process. So with that, let's go on to the next part of our meeting. Um, unless anyone has any comments, there are so many great things that came out of the introductions. Any questions about your new colleagues or? <laughs> okay. Not yet, okay. All right, we'll, we'll move on to the next section. Let's go to where we have been. So I'm gonna do a quick overview of this section. For the past two years, EMAC has developed the following distinct initiatives. So they've been involved with the e developing the charter. They've responded to the OTC charge that Mandy has mentioned. They've been collaborators on the equity framework and the committee uses a trauma-informed approach with all of their work. They've been involved with the development of I-205 toll project performance measures. They developed the foundational statements and they've done dedicated work on EMAX recommendations included in, that are included in shaping an equitable toll program. And at the end of this section, we'll also hear reflections from Commissioner Smith on what it is meant to be an OTC liaison. So that's an overview of our section. And now I'm going to pass it over to our esteemed colleague, Garrett Pryor, because he is a former history teacher. We thought this would be a good role for him. Definitely, thank you, Jessica. Um, Garrett Pryor, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm uh, Mandy's teammate and, the, uh, and Erica's teammate and uh, ODOT's, ODOT's uh, toll policy manager. And we'll take a little quick walk down history lane. Uh, so our first slide here. Um, we've talked about this before, but um, this committee is very unique um, and, and really um, in the sense that it was early on established um, before the toll projects were even being kind of studied or thought about in that early planning stage. Um, really, we look around the nation, kind of the standard practice is to have the projects uh, develop almost kind of almost there to delivery impacts and then equity is talked about. Uh, so this is a really unique process in the sense that um, this is at the forefront. Uh, this started back even in 2017. There was a value pricing feasibility analysis where uh, businesses, nonprofits, elected leaders from around this region uh, looked at the question of where should tolling start and should we move forward? Uh, their answer is yes, move forward. Uh, but to look at these three key areas around transit and multimodal uh, supports and investments, the concerns around diversion and impact to neighborhood health and safety, um, and then to, to that there must be some type of low income program or element to that tolling to go forward. Uh, so those three elements, in addition to equitable and engagement in the process, uh, were really the starting point for the OTC in commissioning this group. Um, and from those really four bullet points that you hear there, um, I'll walk you through this, you know, nice mosaic uh, that's been built to date uh, with still more, more to be done. Uh, next slide. So um, one of the first things this committee did uh, was to talk about, you know, taking the concept of equity, but getting it more specific to the process. Um, I think, um, uh, as that history Mandy walked through, we have so much in the urban planning world, equity has slapped on a lot of current efforts. Uh, but this was a really key first step in defining what does equity mean? What populations are we talking about? Which we have, I believe, uh, seven different populations and groups we're kind of studying and working through. And then not only uh, what is the product, but how? what is the process that we're using to get there? What's that decision-making process? And that was a really key part of it. 
So uh, the, the study you see there on the right done by Transform, uh, Pricing Roads Advancing Equity, uh, is really kind of the standard bearer for congestion pricing and tolling uh, research nationally. Um, and so Chris Lepe, who was a part of that work and now has continued on through, through our team, one of the equity consultants Mandy referenced, was a key uh, author of that report. And so he's been kind of uh, with us to help provide some guidance on how does this, uh, how do you take this kind of concept and actually put it into practice? Um, and I would say one of the lessons learned or the things we're still trying to work through is how do you take uh, what is in the equity framework, which is a very iterative and um, move forward, but then also check back. Um, how do you do that and within a, um, a big transportation decision-making process that are many times very linear, linear um, and take multiple years and one decisions build off of the others. And so um, I'll just say that's a creative conflict that exists then and still exists now, but one that we're trying to work through with you all um, and, and see uh, where we can improve. Uh, next slide. So uh, Dr. Wu, Abe Mullen, others of the committee who have the um, health background, I'm so glad to hear that we're, we're actually growing that, it seems, in this uh, next uh, with some of our new members. Um, but the idea of uh, a trauma-informed perspective and really taking that and looking at, again, not just the products that we're creating and the outcomes we get to, but what is the process we're taking to get there? So um, I won't go through this entire graphic, but I would say it's one of the key pillars for this committee and one we try to keep at the forefront. Um, one thing that's really stood out to me uh, in, in, in working with, with the committee um, is, is that it's the pursuit of transparency, but um, in, in doing that, uh, having the um, intention to actually be accountable for that as well and, and be truthful with uh, what are areas we were hoping to achieve but fell short or couldn't do. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, sometimes agencies are big things, you know, they don't like to admit to that, but that's, uh, I, I think that's a part of that trust building that we've worked on um, uh, the last few years. Uh, next slide. So um, this then uh, is, is an example we wanted to call up of the I-205 toll project performance measures. And so one of the pieces the committee worked on uh, was taking those concepts around equity, but then looking at how is it being studied specifically within a project? How are we applying the equity framework to that project? So in those areas around um, accessibility, affordability, community health, access to opportunity, safety, multimodal transportation. Uh, the committee spent many hours diving into those details in that study. Um, and the outputs of that study we'll see early next year when the draft environmental assessment comes out for the 205 toll project. So I uh, know that there's been a lot of uh, thought put into that and we'll see where we, where, where we land coming up here early next year. Uh, next slide. This uh, that you see here on the screen, the foundational statements, uh, took many of hours uh, to get to. Um, and because what we were really trying to, uh, I remember the committee, we had this November of 2020, I think it was. Yeah, set on the calendar. Uh, EMAC was going to interact with the OTC. And we had just been through, EMAC uh, had just been through six months of looking at literature reviews and studies and research from how tolling projects had worked all over the nation. We had a list of like 30 some recommendations that wanted to be delivered, but we were really trying to find a way with ODOT and the OTC and EMAC to really, what are what what are like a, a limited number of statements or certain things we can all agree on or all support. And so the statements that you see here on the screen, um, I won't read through those, but just talking about that, what's that um, balance between um, trying to pursue climate goals, but then also not overprice the system or be such an economic burden on folks. And, and that, that conflict was really called out. How do we make sure that what happens on the pricing side, on the south side of the river, that those benefits extend over the river and can connect into folks in Washington? So these foundational statements have been really the pillars that we've been uh, building the work off then, uh, that, that past year. Uh, next slide. And so from those foundational statements, which are a bit higher level and more strategic, um, 
the work then was to kind of, okay, how do we break off some of those first actions? Uh, how do we break off more specific pieces um, that we can get committed to and start institutionalizing? Which just to build on Mandy's comment, really will be the work of this committee these next two years. It's a very, it's a really, there's a lot of decisions that are gonna be made. And so getting down into that level of detail is it's what's in your future. And so the, um, the, pieces, the, the actions, the buckets that you see there on the screen uh, are a part of a bigger recommendation document called Shaping an Equitable Toll Program. And they really called out specific either policy directions or actions from the OTC and EMAC that they, uh, they would like to see institutionalized or operationalized uh, within ODOT. And so those are around topics like revenue generation, congestion management, uh, disadvantaged minority and women-owned businesses, um, accountability, not just short-term, but long-term once the tolls are in place, uh, the rate-setting process, and how community-based organizations, uh, like Fabian had mentioned, can be direct beneficiaries and connect into uh, the, the tolling revenue or the program as it goes forward. So with that, that's our quick history lesson for today and walk through memory lane. But um, it was a lot of great work uh, by the committee and a lot of hours spent and uh, look forward to um, hearing what happens next. Thank you, Garrett. Yeah, that was wonderful. So now I'd like to pass it over to Commissioner Smith um, to say a few words about what it's meant to be an OTC liaison since the beginning of EMAC. Commissioner Smith. Thank you. Uh, well, it's been um, a really interesting learning experience uh, for me. I have learned an incredible amount from the committee and the perspectives. It's been um, it's been really valuable to be able to understand perspectives from the committee and and then try and bring the recommendations and the perspectives to the full OTC. Uh, we've had several touch points where we've taken the work from the committee, checked in with the OTC at at an OTC meeting, gotten feedback. And I can tell you that throughout this entire process, the commission has been fully supportive and fully on board with all, all the recommendations that have been made to date. And I think the commission is really looking forward to the next stage, which is really more concrete stage and trying to implement the foundational statements in the actual program specifics. Um, there's been some change uh, on the commission uh, since I started. Um, we've now we're now down two commissioners. We've got a, on a five commission board where there's now only three of us, and we are supposed to be getting a new commissioner. Um, well, we are getting a new commissioner in January, um, but then the new governor is going to be appointing the, um, Commissioner Burke's position. She her last meeting was on in November. So because we're in this period of transition, our chair, um, Chair Van Brocklin, is going to be making some changes to committee assignments. And unfortunately for me, um, I'm going to be transitioning off as the liaison to this committee. So um, we'll have a new commissioner who will dive into the work. I have told um, Jessica and Garrett that to the extent that I can be a resource or continued, you know, checkpoint, I'm happy to do that. I think this work is really critical, um, and and I'm looking forward to seeing it fully fleshed out in the future because it, it's the only way to do tolling in the state of Oregon and Washington. So I'm excited and I'm thankful for all the folks that have been on the committee and who are continuing. I'm excited for the new folks who will bring even more diverse perspectives to the committee. And I, I'm just confident that the work will continue and will be super successful. And, and thank you all for, for all of the time you put in. Thank you so much, Commissioner Smith. Um, so with that, You've, you've heard from Mandy, you've heard from Garrett, and you've heard from Commissioner Smith. These are your partners um, in this whole process. Let's talk about what has helped EMAC become successful 
and what does successful really mean to you for the past two years? And what were the challenges that you experienced? And what stands out to you about EMAP? So we just like to have a, a about a 10, 10 minute discussion here about past successes, accomplishments, and maybe challenges. And then maybe for those of you that are new, what is standing out to you as you're getting engaged and onboarded with this process? So any thoughts about success, accomplishments, challenges? Eduardo? Well, this is just more of a common thinking of our new membership. Has ODOT uh, briefed the new members on why the distinction on the I-205 toll project and then the regional mobility pricing? I think initially when we started talking about that, it was a bit confusing. So if the new members uh, have not been uh, briefed on that and if they want additional information, I think it's an important uh, distinction to make for them. And uh, including also, I guess, the interstate bridge replacement, like why are those three different in what's ODOT's thought process on that. That's a great point. I don't know, uh, Mandy or Garrett, would you like to? I I'm, I don't want to, I mean, maybe if there's time at the end of the meeting, I'm, but I think that's true. It's a critical to understand kind of the different projects that are underway, why they're separate projects, so we're, that we're also developing a toll program and the policy framework for that program. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy to be a point person for okay. specific questions, um, but don't want to take up too much time here. So um, I know some information has been provided already to the new members um, to provide context about the projects and the, the program development, but we can definitely do more. Great. Yeah. Just making sure that they have the information. Thank you. Yeah. Good point. Um, any any other thoughts about and and that would might might be a challenge. So any thoughts about what we've been successful doing or or what stands out to you about the committee? And members, if you're online, if you have any thoughts, please raise your hand so we can hear you or acknowledge you. Oh, uh, so. Well, go ahead. I'll, I'll just start with a very simple comment. I, I think one of the things that's made the committee work doable has been the tremendous amount of support. Um, I think the consultants like Chris, Chris Leppy have been instrumental in providing, I think, a third party um, technical support. So it's not ODOT, it's not us, it's, it's, it's yet another external consultant group that, mm -hmm. in a sense, doesn't have any skin in the game other than the fact that they are supporting the work of this committee. And I think that has been instrumental. The other thing is that I, 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 you know, looking back on our process, which I think was very iterative, um, I think, you know, for example, uh, uh, coming to some agreement about those foundational statements, I think was, was sort of akin to agreeing on a set of values. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you have that foundation, then when you start talking about the recommendations, it's like, all right, so how are we going to achieve this particular statement or this particular value? And then you've got these recommendations that specifically point to one or more of those values. And it makes it, I think, um, it makes it easier to understand how those recommendations fit in as opposed to just being 30 distinct separate recommendations that may not necessarily map to any you know uh, larger bucket and i think having those larger buckets of those values was really critical that was an interesting time yeah you worked yeah. on those right yeah yeah and, and i think it was it was a step in um in aligning with the otc mm. So in other words, uh, we could say, okay, let's all agree on these high level goals, and then we can proceed to the next level. And it makes it easier to make that transition when you've got that common understanding. Right. Right. It's okay. So that's really helpful to hear. So you had consensus that I think there's seven foundational 
There's seven there foundational That's statements correct. and there was consensus on those. Did anybody spend time ranking them or prioritizing those or they're just all seven are important all the time? I, you know, I'm going to defer to the members on that, but I think there was consensus that all seven were important and there was a, there was intentional non-prioritization. Is that, is that, I'm seeing a lot of head nights. So <laughs> great question, Rachel. And also, I think what was really valuable, what you just said, Phil, is how they are the foundational statements. And like the title suggests, they really were foundational to create alignment. And then they were foundational to the recommendations so that the recommendations came from a place of, of the common consensus that, that we had built after the six month process or more of brainstorming with all the different initiatives that, that EMAC had spent doing and also kind of honing in on what are the, how do we, how do we articulate this in a, um, narrow it down somewhat, but it was hard to narrow down. There were what 60, 90, <laughs> there were a lot of initiatives. <laughs> so, um, that's great history. Can I mention a challenge? Did you say? I, yes, yes. I, I, I don't want to hog all the airtime, but, um, but I think one of the challenges um, is, and I think this is probably inherent in any kind of large project like this, where you have multiple stakeholders. But I think the challenge is that there are a lot of other conversations happening in other venues around this very same topic. And I think there isn't as much cross communication mm. as you know one might um, hope for, which makes it a little bit more of a siloed kind of effect. And you know, I mean, there are obviously, I think, probably some advantages to that, but there are some distinct disadvantages as well. So I think we all here know that there are other groups and other committees having conversations about congestion pricing. Mm -hmm. And we hear some of the debates that are going on. Um, and yet we're not directly a part of those conversations, right. nor can we necessarily act upon them. Uh, and so I think that uh, potentially produces some frustration. Interesting tension. Any other thoughts? And I'm going to just ask the members online. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add to the conversation? You're also welcome to ask questions. Pardon me? Absolutely, John. Please go. Yeah. No, I would agree with what was just said. I wouldn't say that this is siloed, but I do think it's been very transparent that we are informing Mm. and influencing the larger project conversation, we're not directing it, mm. right? And so I think we've captured many documents and, and many uh, opinions or goals or the seven principles to inform the project, but by no means are we the deciding group. And I, I think it's fair that that's been very clear and communicated. I will say that this is one of the better staffed committees. I, I didn't realize we'd given up almost three years of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these these big projects take time. Um, and so what I would say to the new committee members is leverage your the staff support to get clarity and to have those one off meetings when you didn't understand you didn't you didn't quite hear or you just like more information that maybe requires a personal follow up meeting to really walk you through why something was decided or if there's still room to move the needle. So especially because what I think what you said in terms of history is not past or past is not history. Um, we're not done. And we're creating something still. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for even the current and the new to inform where we're going. So, and I think staff have been really um, receptive to that. And if if we don't feel like we're being heard, I do feel like we all have the option to go beyond this table and that's appreciated. Thank you, John. And I'm gonna ask any members online, any thoughts? Nick, am I missing any hands? I don't see any, Jessica, but I'm keeping my eye on the list. <laughs> okay. All right. You guys are being a little quiet out there, um, but let us know if you have. So Fabian put something in the chat. 
He said, nothing to add at this moment. Really appreciate what has been said about the challenges of EMAC members uh, that is the, in the role of advising. Thank you, Fabian. Really appreciate that. Um, any, Paul or Lakinte, any thoughts about what it, what stands out to you as a new member of me, EMAC? Um, I think just actually the, the depth and the breadth of the work that's been undertaken so far is quite phenomenal. Um, and just looking at the foundational statements and then just the, the broadness of, of what come from that, I think um, stepping into it and, and working with everybody is 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 slightly daunting um because there is so much so much amazing work being done but really sort of very keen to really delve in further but yeah i think there's just some really really solid work that, that, that there's lots of really strong foundations there to really be built upon so thank you for for the opportunity to be here i guess and thank you for for all the work kudos to this committee it's an amazing committee any any other thoughts michael <clears throat> hi there um so I'll just share, like, I've always appreciated our, like, you know, open discussions mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes there's like topics that we know we want to address, but we're, we're still trying to figure out how to get at them. And um, so I always just like, you know, appreciate, you know, this space and the ability to connect and ask questions about, you know, all, all the different aspects, because there's a lot of information that's been provided. So like, thank you for all of that work. Um, I think one you know, one challenge I think about is, you know, through this process, like the the clarity on um, revenue generation mm -hmm. and how like those things will be spent. Like I know we've sometimes like gone around in a circle on that. Um, and um, I think part of it is that like, you know, modeling is still being worked up. And so it's kind of hard, like, I guess as like, toll rates and, and all of that is being, you know, also discussed in other spaces, um, like Dr. Wu was saying. And so it just makes their, it makes for a little bit of a gap in like information and understanding like what scale of like, you know, revenue are we talking about and, um, you know, what, and then of course my question is like, you know, what will be left and available for like multimodal um, investments and a lot of the things that we listed um, in our foundational statements that we care about. Um, so just, you know, I think that piece is, is always a challenge that I'm, you know, thinking about. Thanks. Well said. I'm looking to these members online. Jeff, any thoughts? No. Okay. I don't want to put anyone on the spot too much. Okay. Well, we're actually, unless, does anyone else in the room have any thoughts they want to share on the discussion? No? Oh, I'll share something briefly just from... Um, I've staffed a lot of committees in my 15 plus years in government. And uh, I would say one of the great attributes of this group was compromise and mm -hmm. finding ways like, I, I know we had specific, I've been thinking about Michael and some of the language we were trying to fine tune there at the end. But like, uh, you know, I, I feel, and I'm so happy when folks come in with a strong opinion or want something, but uh, your ability to voice that and then work with, okay, what, how far can ODOT or the OTC come? And then not, um, and, and I'm totally fine if there's kind of dissenting votes or what, but that ability to like come together on behalf of the group to like have that full like consensus piece. Um, we don't always get that often, uh, especially in our society today. And so to see that happen not just once but routinely throughout this community i think just speaks to the depth and quality of character of the people that are here at this table um and online in this committee and so i've just been uh, uh continually impressed uh with the quality of character of, of folk on on that piece of it so can i mention one other thing Absolutely. which is which is and i think it's, it's sort of uh tease off of what you just said garrett which is you know, I, I think there have been plenty of times when uh, you, Jessica, and the team have had a particular goal in mind uh, as uh, for a particular meeting. Mm -hmm. And as a result of some pretty open conversations and, um, you know, differences of opinions and so forth, we haven't always arrived at the goal that was established for that particular meeting and we've in a sense thrown off the schedule 
And I think what I've appreciated is the flexibility and the resilience of the team to be able to say, okay, we didn't quite get there today, but we will somehow circle back and continue this conversation and keep the ball rolling. So in other words, there's a, a fair amount of give and take. And I think it's the willingness to do that that's been very important. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think right back at you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's been it's been great to work with you and and that fluidity and that that flexibility has been vital to this process. Um that's great. I don't know. Any other thoughts? Because I, I think I'm gonna look, not seeing, not seeing any hands. Well, why don't we, that's a, this is a good time to pause. We're going to take our five minute break. So let's reconvene at 414 <laughs> in exactly five minutes. <laughs> Thanks everyone.
And for our members of the public that have joined us online, we'll get started in just another minute or so as our EMAC members who are attending in person uh, get back from break. Thank you. So let's talk about where we are going. So to get where we're going, we'll use the EMAC 2022-2025 work plan. So please feel free to reference it in your meeting packets that are on the table or the meeting materials that we sent to you. Welcome, James. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, actually, before we get going, if it's okay with you, James, I'd love to take a moment to allow you to introduce yourself. Please get settled. <laughs> but so while we're getting ready, if you wanna take a look at the work plan, it's in your handouts. Um, um, and then James, do you wanna take a, a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm James Paulson. Um, I'm a returning EMAC member. It's good to see um, a lot of returning faces. Um, I guess as an, another piece to it, um, I'm also sitting on the regional, I'm terrible with acronyms. <laughs> Tolling Advisory Committee, right? Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I am sitting on that as a representative of EMAC. Um, so I get a lot of opportunity to talk about tolling. So this is great. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. So I just wanted to pause. So James is our Regional Toll and Tolling Advisory Committee liaison. So he's on that other committee. Um, and he'll be, we'll spend time during the meetings for him to provide kind of a bridge between what's going on with that meeting and, and what EMAC is doing. So thank you for that, James. So we'll be talking about the EMAC 2022 work plan objectives. And if you look at the plan, you can kind of see that there are the following components. It's going to, we're going to look at the work on the toll projects, which will involve continuous coordination with the toll project teams for involvement in the project analysis. We'll also be looking and working on the low-income toll program and rulemaking. So this will involve a coordinated effort on recommendations for rules on customer service, low-income programming, and the rates, rate scheduling. And then the other component of our program, a very important one that we've heard a lot about is accountability. So what does accountability and sustainability look over the long term? So EMAC will co-plan and participate in annual workshops with ODOT to take a deep dive into equity recommendations regarding sustaining accountability and advancing equity. So to walk us through our where we're going and our work plan objectives, I'm going to turn it back over to Garrett. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. 
So um, what you see here on the screen is what uh, Mandy and I and others spend many hours of our day thinking about and trying to coordinate are the many uh, different groups about how we can structurally gain input and um, uh, make decisions uh, throughout this process. So at the top and at the center of that chart is the Oregon Transportation Commission. Commissioner Smith is one of those five members. Uh, they're the toll rate setting authority for Oregon. Um, they'll also be making the kind of policy and the funding decisions around toll rate of allocation. Um, another key box there I wanted to highlight is the U.S. Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration. Uh, the types of tolling we're looking at are on federal highways, I-5 and I-205, um, and so they're key partners and, and play a key decision-making role um, through a lot of the environmental review and analysis process and getting that approval. And then uh, for the regional mobility pricing project, they'll go through um, a special type of approval called the value pricing pilot program. Um, and that needs um, uh, basically uh, up to the Secretary of Transportation, Secretary Pete's signature uh, to get that approval. Um, what I then wanna draw your attention to is the bottom left and the bottom uh, right. Uh, so these are the uh, other toll advisory committees um, that are have recently started or about to start here in the uh, new year. Um, I'll, I'll just talk about their reporting structure here, and in the next slide, I'll go and talk about some of their goals um, and then how this committee uh, can help be coordinated and informed by what's going on in those other venues. Uh, the Regional Toll Advisory Committee uh, is made up of around 25, 30 people, uh, representatives of businesses, nonprofits, elected leaders from around here in the Portland metro area. Um, they just started meeting a few months ago. James has attended every meeting and been a great uh, voice for the types of uh, questions they're going to get into, which are primarily around the toll projects themselves. Um, and how do those toll projects address some of the key pillars uh, that this group does? Uh, this group is looking at as well around transit multimodal investments, uh, affordability, um, and uh, uh, transit multimodal, and neighborhood health and safety, the diversion piece. Uh, now, they'll be looking at it from a, a slightly different lens in the sense that um, where you all talk about kind of strategy and policy, they're more down uh, of the specific level of like bus improvements on a certain line or specific projects uh, within uh, the congestion pricing system. The statewide toll rulemaking advisory committee, the bottom right there, uh, they're about to start here in early 2023, um, 15 to 20 uh, people from uh, representative from throughout the state. Um, and they'll be working on a, a, a kind of a, a rulemaking process, which is a process that is kind of um, known for when you want to revise kind of Oregon administrative statutes, so the rules around tolling. Um, and they'll be looking at the uh, customer rules, so the interface enforcement, um, kind of topics like that, uh, as well as uh, what are the... Um, what's the system in how toll rates are set and then adjusted. They'll be working on the rules around that piece of it. Um, let's go to the next slide. And, oh, sorry, and both of those committees report and inform ODOT on their decision-making processes. Uh, that's different from, uh, slightly different from you all to where you have a direct line to the Oregon Transportation Commission, um, but also can, um, can advise ODOT and Mandy and others here on how the projects are developed. Uh, next slide. So the way we have envisioned and, and worked really from building upon the recommendations that this group and the OTC supported uh, last July would be have uh, an active EMAC member on that rulemaking advisory committee. Um, we pr pr propose that that be Dr. Wu here, be that representative between EMAC and the rulemaking group uh, to ensure those alignment and status updates. Um, because the there's there's some of the content around um, the low income toll program and that rate setting um, and rulemaking process, uh, that we do plan to have interaction between what happens at this table and then what uh, happens at that rulemaking committee table. And so through the work plan you see here, we're trying to align the two to where before the the rulemaking committee makes their recommendations to ODOT. Uh, you all are able to provide that input to the committee of what what you see from a from an equity and mobility perspective on those questions. 
Um, and then the Regional Toll Advisory Committee, uh, I, we've kind of mentioned it before, but that's James is kind of our liaison to there. So if there are specific things that are coming from that project level where, um, uh, you know, for example, if there's a certain transit proposal um, uh, that comes out of there that can inform the type of like policy and strategy work that this table will be working at, uh, James could help be our liaison to kind of uh, shuttle that information. Next, next slide. The low income toll program. So uh, I'll talk later in the meeting about a key step in that. We had a low income toll report uh, that was uh, adopted. Um, but really, the next two years of work are going to be institutionalizing it, operationalizing that. So in specifically into rules, but then also into um, what is, is it a free credit? Is it an exemption? Is it, you know, what uh, what economic level? We've talked about 200 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level. But what uh, degree is that subsidy or discount? Um, and so this this committee will help um, continue to work on that development of that program and then uh, the process and how we do that as well. So how do we come to those decisions? And we'll work with you all on helping it inform that. Next slide. So at the toll project level, we'll kind of build on what we've done in the past. I highlighted that example of the different performance measures. On the left side of the screen, you see uh, what I referenced before when these environmental assessment documents come out, kind of what are the outputs of that study and the analysis, what was committed to uh, for mitigation, meaning what, what are those investments or improvements that are brought with the project to help um, uh, address areas where impacts were identified. So that's for the 205 toll project. For the regional mobility pricing project, uh, we'll look at the, the methodologies. So what is gonna be studied for environmental justice and social resources. We'll then look at um, once that study is complete or to a draft form, uh, what are the, uh, the, imp the impacts and the benefits and the strategies to address those. Um, and throughout that whole process, uh, what what's the, um, work of engagement. How are we taking that equity framework and applying it um, to the project and actually living that out? Next slide. And uh, this is a new piece and I think a really unique uh, part of anchoring all the different work that's going on and it kind of building on those foundational statements. Uh, but we're proposing to have what's called kind of uh, annual workshops or accountability workshops between uh, OTC, EMAC, and ODOT uh, to look at uh, of the many different decisions that are going on, uh, how are we doing? Are we meeting the mark? Are we missing the mark? Um, and so in your work plan, you'll see they're built into the schedule where we'll have these uh, maybe longer meetings. We kind of have to work on the venue and forum and all that. Uh, but could be a real place of um, uh, being able to kind of to kind of check in time uh, specifically with this group to see where where everything's at. And so I won't walk through uh, this chart, all, all the verbiage here, but I did I just want to explain the structure a bit. Um, so as you can see, um, this is an aggressive work plan. There's a lot to be done here and a lot to kind of hit the ground running uh, and going. Um, but uh, I think our our best shot at keeping this committee informed and up to date and uh, giving you the opportunity to inform these decisions um, before they're made uh, really is all laid out here in the work plan. And so we talk about the timeline of the different months, um, when we're going to build towards just feedback or recommendations, kind of that level of input, and then who the recipient is, who you'd be providing that input to. Uh, next slide. So um, that, that other slide was just kind of a continuation of that along down the time. So with that, Jessica, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Garrett. That was a lot of information. It was very helpful. So I think before we actually start to the discussion, does anyone have any clarifying questions about all this great content we just walked through? And this is, again, our, our new 2022 to 2025 work plan. We, we talked about the different components, the three, the, the four different components, um, and and Garrett just walked us through it in detail. Any any questions? And and those of you online, any any questions? James over here. James, <laughs> sorry, I'm so busy looking online. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so um, thanks for running through. That's a lot in a little bit of time. And looking at that last slide that kind of talked about the timeline, um, I was just wondering on that timeline, because I know in the past we've done a lot of meetings, like subgroups and so forth. Are we going to also stay with that kind of a structure going forward to move this work forward? We are. And also, I, my apologies, um, the work plan should be in your meeting handouts. So you can see that this there's a this the schedule that we put together. Um, we'll be doing the big meetings uh, once a month, once every other month, and then in the in between months, we'll be doing subcommittee meetings. And probably as we have been doing historically, as needed, we'll be doing the subcommittee meetings. So for sure. Good question, Eduardo. Yeah, thank you, and. Uh, I do want to apologize in case I missed it from one of the subcommittee meetings, but uh, how did we determine that an annual accountability check-in with uh, the decision-making body was sufficient for this group? Uh, a lot of decisions will be made over the last, uh, over the next couple of years, uh, not just by the OTC, but other uh, regional players. Uh, I don't know. How did we come up with that? I guess is the most basic question. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. I see Mandy reaching for her microphone. I, I think it was just, it was a guess at what, <laughs> what might be helpful um, and that uh, maybe it's not enough. So, I mean, this work plan is our best, was our best attempt at trying to think about what's happening with the projects and the other committees. And I appreciated Dr. Wu's comments about flexibility earlier, because um, my guess is that at some point, as we move forward with the work plan, either because conversations take longer than they they appear on the work plan or because project schedule shift or other advisory committee uh, schedule shift, like we'll probably need to make some updates as we go. But um, if if there's a desire to have those workshops more frequently, I think that's possible. Um, I think we'll need to have a little thought about when we might have uh, might be able to really start the first, I mean, maybe the first one could start a little bit sooner, um, but if there's a desire to have more than one a year, I think that's something that we can definitely figure out. Thank, thank you, Mandy, for that answer. Uh, I do think it's important that as we kick off this next phase that we do have that kind of face-to-face -face and get in alignment um, and then embark on that next part of the journey. Um, I do appreciate that it was thought of and included. I thought maybe it came out of a subcommittee meeting, but can appreciate that staff uh, was uh, intentional in including something like that. And we uh, perhaps consider how we can, you know, make it uh, a little bit better and make sure that uh, Emacs work is being reflected in the decision making. Again, that's been one of my sticking points. Is that um, you know I think everybody on this group would be concerned that. Uh, be some kind of facade for um, trying to achieve equity. So anyways, again, just that accountability, transparency. Yeah, thank you. Great point, Eduardo. And actually, so the first workshop will be January uh, 2023. So it's about six months from now. So, and maybe that first workshop will determine what you might think about ongoing accountability. Pardon me? I say January. July. July. I, did I say January? I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, July. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> so, well, why don't we look at our discussion question, unless anyone else has any clarifying questions? Okay, let's just, the discussion question that we're, we'd like to just, explore is what are the opportunities and challenges with this work plan? And then what are the priorities that EMAC has for the plan? So if you, you identify, and I think you kind of started hinted at what opportunities and challenges might be. Um, but then the second part is what does EMAC think the priority should be with our robust work plan? And it might be helpful to kind of turn to the work plan and your materials um, and remind ourselves and maybe I don't I know we were going to try to maybe pull up the work plan online. If you're able to do that, Rochelle, um, if it's too much, that's fine. But if you want to look at the work plan. 
and just consider what the opportunities are and the challenges um, and what would be your priority? And maybe Eduardo, you already kind of have a sense of a priority. If you wanna, do you have any? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Not, I don't mean to put you on the spot. James. Hi, sorry for coming late and talking a lot. <laughs> um, I think the one thing when I look at this, it's a very aggressive plan. And the one thing that I don't want to see happen is that because we have such an aggressive timeline and there's such a depth of work to do that we get to the point where we're just kind of rubber stamping stuff through because we're trying to make the timeline. And so I want to make sure that we have the time to do the outreach. We have the time to do the deeper discussions and um, that we're all committed to that. And sometimes that does mean that we need to have additional meetings or so forth. But I think that's where we get to um, a better outcome. Fantastic. Anyone want to add to that? Michael. Thank you. Um, I, I was just thinking, like, I think one thing on my mind, of course, is like, uh, is a discussion around um, revenue investments <laughs> and just building on like, you know, the conversation around like, um, you know, accountability and, you know, doing like the, the annual check-ins um, with OTC, you know, sounds good to me. And in our foundational statements, you know, we we the first one listed um, was provide enough investment to ensure that reliable emissions reducing and a competitive range of transportation options. So biking, walking, bus, carpool, van pull, that those are um, invested in. But it's that question around enough, like what is enough? And so I, I um so I, so I guess I would hope, like, I guess I, one of the questions is like, what is a priority? And that is one of the priorities that I see is that I hope we can get more clarity um, and um, have discussion around like, what is, you know, enough? Cause we, we I, you know, have talked about, um, or in EMAC one, we talked about like, we wanna see those things supported. Um, and so, so the, I guess that's the conversation where I'm not sure where it fits in exactly like in in the work plan, but it's a it's like a piece that I don't want us to lose track of. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, you know, you know, maybe this is the space for it or maybe there are other spaces that are grappling with that question. So if that's the case, it, it would be great to uh, be able to have like an update about that here as well. And if I can tag on to that, I wonder if 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 some of that conversation um, actually ends up uh, happening both at RTAC, but also at STRAC, Strac. you know, and, and so the give and take between those three entities mm -hmm. seems like it'll be really important. And our agenda is obviously our agenda, but our agenda is sort of dependent on their agenda and vice versa. That and that's what this work plan says, you know, that there's this coordinated effort of coordinating the recommendations between the committees. So the STRAC, so the, the state tolling rate rulemaking advisory committee. <laughs> so the STRAC. And actually, so it's great that you mentioned that, Dr. Wu, because you will be well, our I, so, so I I guess the, the bottom line is, is it going to be James and me that will essentially be the bridges between these three groups i i'm with you i think that um i want to definitely not be the bridge but the representative and so you know just it's really moving the information to move the conversation um from this to that other yeah. group and vice versa because i know in the rack or whatever the regional transportation <laughs> advisory committee um i've brought up there about the prioritization you know and it's not decided and so i could see one group says here's how we prioritize the other group says here's how we prioritize and we say here's how we prioritize and it's going to be interesting to see um how that plays out as far as the the 
um, trade-offs is, you know, environment versus people versus community, all of those trade-offs, because there's no easy solutions to this. That's why we have these groups. And well, so and I think it's, it's, it's one thing to be a representative to a particular group um, and, and a conveyor of information. It's another to be an adjudicator and to somehow resol help resolve what might be differences. And so I'm not clear about, about how that happens. And and I I think at, to Mandy's point earlier it's it's fluid and we're it's evolving and I, and I think you know we'll we'll plan on bringing you into the meeting and bringing in a reporting structure that that will support you so you can report back and forth, um, but I think this committee gets to help work with you on that and so I think so in our work plan we need to find ways to do that so I think there's going to be you know a reporting period, but there will also be point, you know, what's the topic that we're focusing on? And then what's the topic that our TAC is focusing on? And what's STRAC focusing on? And how is that, you know, and coordinating those efforts well. So, and I, John, it looks like you've had a comment. Well, I mean, so we have a work plan. Do the other committees have a work plan? Because the schedule should be pretty late, pretty well laid out. So they already would have a time scheduled to talk about investments. And the question is, do we get to inform the investment conversation before it happens or after it happens, before we get to the final commitments at the end of the project? And how many iterations? Because that's what I am struggling with. It's like, we're going to talk about things for a while, but it really is, here are these large decision points, and here's when we're going to pre-discuss them, pre-make recommendations, mm -hmm. or either, you know, you're either editing or writing. And and I know that Mandy has something to say about this, so I'm going to turn it over to her. But that is an excellent point because the whole point is to bring you in to inform the decision. Sure, I couldn't have said it better. So right, that the that's the intent is that you'll be part of the conversation before the decisions are made, um, and the um, our TAC, the Regional Towing Advisory Committee. Um, they're almost finalized. They've almost finalized their charter, um, but uh, one of their more recent like edits and additions was really to hone in on um, their role in criteria related to revenue allocation and then recommendations. Um, so that will be part of their conversation. It won't but we don't yet have the revenue, especially for regional mobility pricing project, we don't have the information about revenue estimates. So this is part of the like frustration, I think, of this process is that um, we do the environmental analysis and we understand the benefits of the project. And then the financial analysis is on a slightly different track. So it will be coming. Um, but there'll be other conversations to have first. So I hear that that's frustrating, but you will definitely be um, very much a part of that conversation. Just a quick question, I mean, the uh, with R track and S track, um, would it not then make sense to have folks from those committees sitting on these committees as we have representatives from here? I um, that's a great question, and and um, I <laughs> I'm going to defer to uh, Garrett and Mandy about that i i think i mean the hope is that there there is a liaison now between the committees and so that that it it's definitely additional um requests on the shoulders of uh of these two committee members um but that they they would be sharing information back and forth and you know we have thought that maybe at some point there might need there might be like joint workshops or mm -hmm. you know joint meetings so um the the STRAC the state uh, rulemaking advisory committee hasn't been officially launched yet so that goal is to start that up early next year um so we still and the other one is new. So we're still trying, you all are the most established. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're trying, based on what we know, we've done the best we can to line up the work plan. Um, and then we'll continue to be responsive as they, as they move forward. One thing that I've seen is since we do have a, like a two-year head start, <laughs> that, you know, it's like, EMAC keeps coming up and and so then we're more prominent and because 
when they start talking about stuff, it's like, we've already discussed this. We've already come up with some recommendations and prioritization. And so, you know, it's to John's point around, we wrote it and you can try and we can edit it, but we already wrote it. So we were able to establish the conversation on a lot of those things. And that won't change. So the STRAC will get all of your work when they start um, in terms of the foundational statements and the equity framework. So that'll be a key parameters uh, that they'll be moving forward with. Uh, that is also in the intention of how we set up this committee. And we're not, I think the word siloed was used before. I would use the word prioritized. Um, and so we're really being intentional about who are the voices in the room and not trying to just add more and more people to say like, we have representation, but really make sure that we can get to the depth uh, that we want to get to. So there's some intentionality around kind of, you know, who's in, who's not in the room, and when do we use other times or other venues like workshops or other things to coordinate? Great question, though. Does that answer your question? No. So any more challenges or or just, you know, thoughts about the work plan? Thank you so much, Rochelle. We put it on screen, the work plan. Um, if you kind of see there's, you know, the two key areas, which is toll projects and the need for process, which is the green row on the first, mm -hmm. the first row, and then turning OTC recommendations and commitments and sustaining accountability. That's, that's, you know, the second row. So that's really, those are the two parallel tracks that EMAC is working on. And, and to James's point, um, and John, that, you know, EMAC has had a two and a half you're running to start. If you keep digging into the work and moving it forward, you will also continue to, you know, be the strong voice um, and support the other work that's happening around uh, the tolling universe, if you will. How about members online? Any any thoughts or comments or even questions about the work plan? We have a quiet group online. <laughs> okay, got it. Just observe. It's a lot to process. Um, let's see. Anyone else? Any other thoughts about the work plan? I mean, it is it is a lot to absorb, and we've we've plotted out you know almost two years. And but we also understand that this is a living document, and we're gonna it's going to evolve over time. Um, but you can see it's it's a robust agenda. A lot to go through. Um, it's it's a super exciting work plan, and you might need some more time with it because I think we just sent it out to you last week, right, <laughs> Eduardo? Uh, and, and maybe staff doesn't have an answers for this at the moment, but staying on that message of uh, alignment and making sure that we are uh, leading with with equity because this group. Uh, is dealing, working through all of the very complex uh, topics that are connected to equity. And we are a deliberative and, you know, all have the uh, our thoughts and opinions. Um, if our work plan is delayed, because that has been, ha that has happened in the first version, uh, does that trigger a delay for the other decision-making groups as well? So just, you know, again, you don't have to give an answer tonight, perhaps, but uh, a consideration. Um, the second comment that I did want to make is just if we can also get information uh, as these groups are uh, forming their charters, what the length of uh, incorporation. So I guess like what is the stature being given to the foundational statements? Is it something that they can just interpret to their to however they see fit and can like, you know, <laughs> yeah, pick and choose. <laughs> are they given wiggle room or is it? you know, like a constitutional authority. <laughs> I mean, if, in terms of like my comment about the the STRAC, the, the new committee that will start, um, I, I think it will be part of kind of, here's the framework for how you're operating. So it's not policy per se, there will be 
toll policies that are also provided to that group that hopefully are finalized in, in around the same time that they're starting up. Um, but it will be presented as a key element of the work that's been done and the guidance for how we're moving forward. So um, it's you know not not policy, not constitutional. Um, I think that you you've heard from Commissioner Smith and the rest of the commission that there is um, concurrence and agreement, strong support for that work. Um, ultimately, it is the commission that does make the decisions here. So um, they're, I think, well aligned with the work that this committee has done. Well, I mean, I would like to think, you know, to the point about EMAC having this two year head start um, and the fact that the OTC has aligned and agreed on the foundational statements and our recommendations that that in and of itself kind of sets almost a gold standard that would, I think, make it difficult to completely circumvent or go around. Someone would have to come up with something better. Yeah, yeah, well, and, yeah. You know, like, let's see you know, whip and, it up, you know. And then there would have to be a process of <laughs> agreement and alignment. Yeah. Not, <laughs> there's not a, no competition. Nope, trying, yeah. There's no, no competition. <laughs> well said. Well, we're we're just a little bit over time, but does anyone have any more thoughts? Questions, comments about the EMAC work plan going forward. And I'm going to look online. I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Maybe we're ready to move on then. I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, great. Thank you for that discussion. So now let's move on to our toll project status update. And what I'd like to do now is pass it over to Mandy to kick us off. Uh, well, I just wanted to uh, remind people of the... <laughs> Sorry, my sticky reminders right there. Um, I just wanted to start with a little bit of a reminder and or recentering of kind of the context that these toll projects are being developed within. Um, and the map that you see is ODOT's urban mobility strategy, a, a pictorial representation of that, um, that shows the core projects of this strategy, which really is a comprehensive approach at, at figuring out how to improve mobility and reduce congestion for the broader Portland metropolitan area, and doing that in a way that centers equity and supports state and regional climate goals. Um, you'll see some of the core projects. Um, the ODOT core projects are in orange here and the um, interstate bridge replacement at the top as a joint effort between ODOT and the Washington Department of Transportation. You'll also see a variety of partner projects on here, um, knowing that we need everything to move forward in a successful fashion in order to achieve this um, future vision. Um, the tolling and the regional mobility pricing project is the navy on i5 and i205 it really is the backbone of this um this map and this strategy um really uh providing the foundation to think about mobility in a new way um and uh hopefully in a way that also contributes to an ongoing and sustainable revenue source and then the i205 toll project is at the bottom of the map um, in orange and outlined in light green, which is a little hard to see here in the room. Um, and so that is the other project moving forward as part of the whole program at this point. Um, do I have the next slide too? I think I'm doing this one and then I'll hand it off to the regional mobility pricing project team um, for their update. Um, so we are uh, have already started the National Environmental Policy Act process for the I-205 toll project. This is a federal um, policy um, that outlines a process to move forward with um, public involvement and engagement um, uh, during the analysis of uh, a project um, and prior to making decisions. Uh, we work closely with the Federal Highway Administration um, on this work, um, and we're expecting our draft environmental assessment out early next year, likely in the February timeframe. 
um, that will be available for public review and comment. Um, EMAC has been very involved in the development of that in terms of the methodologies and also the performance measures um, that will be evaluated and presented in that document. So um, that's a great milestone for the team. And then um, the analysis will be revised or refined um, based on comments received. And then a revised or final environmental assessment will be published. Um, and then we'll look at Federal Highway Administration to provide a federal decision on the analysis and the findings. Um, and so we're, we're expecting that kind of late summer um, 2023. Um, and then just to note here on uh, mitigation. So Garrett mentioned mitigation in his earlier presentation. Um, in this uh, environmental assessment framework, you look at the benefits and the impacts of your proposed project. And for the 205 tolling project, we're looking at um, adding the missing third lane on that seven mile section of Interstate 205. Um, seismically improving uh, multiple bridges. Um, there's about eight of them in that uh, section of the corridor um, and then adding some sound walls. And so that capital project and the addition of variable rate tolling is what's analyzed in the environmental assessment. Um, we look at benefits and impacts. And then if there are impacts, um, then we're required to mitigate them. And so the environmental assessment will share those ideas on mitigation. Um, and then the final document would codify those commitments. Um, and that in the federal decision, um, when we get to that point, if, if the finding is finding of no significant impact, it would clarify what we'd be expected to do for mitigation. Um, mitigation, once it's determined and committed to, is no longer optional. It's a requirement, and the project, the bigger project, tolling and um, the capital construction, can't move forward separate from the mitigation. Um, that becomes the, the responsibility of the state. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that clarity. Um, on that mitigation, because once that sounds like once the mitigation has been determined by the environmental impact, then it's in stone. Is there an opportunity to then, before it goes into stone, to say, here's the findings, what opportunity of influencing what actually happens as mitigation is there? Great question. And during the comment period on the draft environmental assessment, that the, exactly the kind of information and input we'd be looking for. But the decision on mitigation is made by the feds or who is the person that makes the mitigation decision? The project team um, has been working with our local partners um, to think about mitigation for traffic related impacts. For example, um, if there's an intersection that uh, we're looking at that will slip below standards, um, then we would think about what are the improvements that could be made to to solve that problem. Um, and so we've had some conversations with our with our jurisdictional partners um, that are responsible for the intersection, like the oversight and management of those. Um, FHWA has been a part of our conversations. They don't they don't tell us though, here's what you have to do to mitigate. It really is based on the specific findings and then ideas of how you could solve that problem. So there's a bit of latitude there. So the when I look into my fictitious glass ball and I look at um, some of the mitigation challenges, um, one of the things you hear a lot about are diversion, obviously. So staying with your example, if there was like, hey, here's an inter intersection that's going to be impacted and, and we're going to make these changes to it um, to help um, reduce that impact, then you could have local businesses or people saying, yeah, you did some mitigation, but it's not enough. And if that mitigation is already, it's in stone, it's done, then where's the it's not enough opportunity or is there an opportunity right and we good questions we have our data and our you know modeling work to go on to try to figure out like if you do these things here's what's likely to happen uh, we will also have a monitoring program as like part of the mitigation will include monitoring so um, there will then be further conversations of what are we monitoring how long you know what's the frequency of that monitoring what are the 
the metrics that we're going to be evaluating over time um, to make sure that we get it right um, and that the project that we plan for mitigation does what it's supposed to do. Because I'm just going to say it. I, this is I can see my store is here. These diversion happens. These mitigation steps were done. That reduced my revenue by X percent. You didn't. You started measuring a year later, you come back and say, oh, actually, we can see that your revenue is down by this much. And yeah, that's true. Now what? What are you going to do for me? That's the question I have. And, you know, it could go from diversion to all the different aspects of this project. But Mandy, so ultimately, I would assume that the feds are the ones who have to sign off on the entire environmental analysis absolutely correct so is it in so once they've done that then are the all the mitigation recommendations essentially in stone once that their commitments yeah right. yes okay so yeah so so our accountability piece which we've talked mm -hmm. about almost ad nauseum <laughs> it, it becomes somewhat limited uh, once that whole NEPA process is complete and the mitigation recommendations have been essentially approved, later on, I think to James's example, uh, it seems like then the the ability to then be accountable for what happens at that local level becomes a little limited. I think it would be the monitoring program, you know, that that the input in terms of what should be included in the monitoring program, the specifics of that would be something that would benefit from your input. My fear is the dollars are already gone. Like to the point of once that NEPA is done, once that's set, then that's going to determine where the dollars are going to flow for whatever mitigation needs to take place and then in the monitoring i don't know if there's dollars that come if you find in monitoring there's a shortcoming then does that then release oh there's these other funds that are going to get released to help do additional mitigation oh sure and so and the challenging part about nepa is that nepa um nepa wants to focus on the project and the impacts and the ben the, the benefits um it's not a document that talks a lot about costs so um, or sources, but the state would be responsible for the mitigation regardless of what the funding sources are for the mitigation. So some of it might be toll revenue, some right. of it might be other sources. Um, the, the point is really though that it's it's not an option once it's it's a commitment, once it's the federal decision comes down, um, then there's federal oversight and requirements that that must happen. And it, I mean, I feel like we're getting a little off track because my understanding is NEPA is not every, it's, I see it as a minimum. Here's what the project minimally agrees to do in order to move the project forward. And those those commitments do have financial ramifications, but there's nothing stopping the community or ODOT or many other groups sort of saying, we want to go beyond that. And to be fair, ODOT will ultimately own that cost, whether it's being supported by any federal project dollars or ODOT or even the tolling. So because we we can't possibly know everything that's going to happen over the next five to 10 years in the region and nor can ODOT, but ODOT is the Oregon Department of Transportation. So if there are other things that we need, ODOT's going to be first in line to sort of support those costs, even going beyond a plan for NEPA of what we imagine we think we need today. Is that fair? Is that close? I, I think so. I think we're saying similar things. Right. That I mean, the NEPA analysis there and the mitigation really has, there has to be a clear nexus between an impact right. um, caused by the project and then the mitigation. So um, I think sometimes you, people use mitigation in a variety of ways, but for, for this context, it's very specific that it has to tie directly to an impact um, and it's a solution that addresses that impact. Um, and then, you know, in terms of monitoring, there will be costs associated with monitoring and, and that will become a, a toll program cost um, that will be um, first for 205, then it'll be part of the regional regional project as well. I just wanted to build quickly on, on John's example, because you're, you're right, even through the discussion of this committee around carpooling and van pooling and those other mobility options, that 
because you pursued that strategy and vocalized that, one of the things that was committed to by the OTC when they got the big federal legislation was an innovative mobility program. They carved off $20 million to start getting some of those resources and, and things in place prior to tolling even starting. And so continue the work that you're doing here uh, in, in pursuing of what are those strategies, what are the mobility policies, because long term, that's what's going to orient those um, allocation decisions, revenue decisions, um, and what gets committed to there. NEPA is a step, uh, but really focus on the policies and the strategies. That's where I think you're going to have the biggest long-term impact. Says the policy manager. <laughs> Keeps me employed, so it's helpful. Yeah, And, and I'm just going to do a quick time check. Um, this was a great discussion. Thank you for that. Um, I think, Mandy, do you have anything more you'd like to share about the I-205? That's Okay, great. And we have another speaker who's going to take us through the next slides on the Regional Mobility Pricing Project update. Josh, are you with us? I am. Hi there. Um, oh. I'm Josh Channel. He, him pronouns. Uh, I'm the technical team lead for the Regional Mobility Pricing Project. Can you hear me all right? Um, you know, it, you sound a little muffled. How is it for everyone else? I'm a little muffled. Can you, yeah, can you try... Try to clear that up. <laughs> yes, I <it> can. Sorry. <laughs> it's the fun of hybrid. But we see you perfectly, Josh, so that's good. How about now? A, a little better? Is it better? More time. Is, is that on, we're checking with our, our team here, Josh, to see if it's in on our end. How is it for you all online when, when Josh is speaking? Josh, a little model. Josh, I think the sound quality is pretty typical um, for, for what you have. Um, so I'm not sure there's going to be too much improvement available tonight, but we can work on it in the future. I'm trying one more microphone here. Is that any better? That is better. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, so Josh Channel, he, him pronouns. I'm the technical team lead for the Regional Mobility Pricing Project, which is the, the project Mandy outlined in blue on the map before, the larger of the two toll projects this group is involved in. Um, it's really nice to be back. It's been a long time since I was in front of the EMAC, um, meet some of you all for the first time, to see some old friends. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. It may look like I'm camping in the Great Tetons, but I'm just at home sick, which is part of why the voice is a little compromised today. Um, we did just hit a really exciting milestone on the project. After a year and a half of planning, we have officially kicked off our, our NEPA phase, which is uh, we've been talking about a little bit today, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Um, and over that last uh, year and a half of planning, we studied potential options for how to move congestion pricing forward on the RMPP and uh, developed a statement of why the project is needed, what it's for, call their purpose and need. Um, working with the low income toll report team that's been out, uh, has come and talked to the EMAC before, identified ways to assist drivers that are experiencing low incomes. And uh, we invited a lot of public input. We'll cover a little bit of that today. There's been a tremendous amount of input in this project over time. Um, thousands of comments and dozens of community briefings. Uh, workshops, webinars, uh, to the best we could in our, our virtual environment. And now we're starting to emerge back into the physical environment a little bit more. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, also working with, uh, in partnership with our community engagement liaisons who have come and talked um, to the EMAC in the past. We work in five different languages, a number of different communities, um, and also with our uh, community-based organization partners, a lot of toolkits and, and outreach through those. Um, to really uh, try to reach folks that have historically been excluded from transportation planning or been harder to engage. Um, so we very much appreciate that the EMAC members have, uh, have participated in a lot of these discussion groups and a lot of this outreach, so thank you. Um, next slide, please. So uh, real quick, what's the NEPA process for those that are newer to this group? It's a federal requirement. We do this in uh, coordination with the Federal Highway Administration and USDOT. Um, our NEPA process has officially kicked off now. The first piece of this is called scoping. Um, and this is the phase where we we're, we're setting up the scope, the, 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 the range of what we're trying to study in the environmental document that we're gonna be preparing over the next year. So um, 
in the environmental document, we'll study in detail and we'll disclose the, the impacts and the benefits of the project. We do think there's a lot of potential benefits to the region, but we also anticipate that there's going to be some negative effects, issues that we want to mitigate. Andy was uh, talking about mitigation before. So through the NEPA process, we'll look at this in detail and incorporate the mitigation measures into the project and become part of the project itself. But scoping is the very first step of this process. It helps inform the, the scope or the range of community environmental issues that we'll study in the environmental analysis. So we kicked off the scoping period. We're at the midway point right now. It's a 50 day scoping period running through January 6th. And I'll sh share in a little bit how to, how to participate in that. We can go to um, next slide. So um, we are uh, have uh, over the last year and a half gotten a lot of feedback on, on what people um, think that the, uh, our analysis should cover. Um, and so I've got a, a short list here. I won't go through all of these, but we are going to look at a wide range of, of topics in, in the analysis. Um, in particular, uh, a lot of questions about safety, about transportation system efficiency. What does this mean for neighborhood traffic? What does it mean for air quality? What does it mean for climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so you can uh, see, and, and we've got more information online for sort of how, how we're looking at these different topics. Um, Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, we are using this scoping period right now to raise awareness about the project. There's been a lot of press about it recently. Uh, we have provided a lot of materials on the website for, pe for people to dig into over the past year. Um, and even though the scoping period just began, uh, we are getting a lot of, a lot of good feedback. Um, we have already received over 2,000 comments um, and uh, have um, uh, had uh, two webinars where we had over 100 participants. Uh, we had a webinar with our participating agencies, the different state and local um, and regional governments that we work with. So, and um, yeah, lots of visitors to the webpage, uh, had a community tabling event. Um, so we're starting to get back out there in the, the non-virtual physical world um, and a lot of briefings. So, um, Let's see, I want to talk a little bit about some of the kind of approaches we've used for, for uh, engagement sort of with a broader range of communities, working a lot with our community engagement liaisons to share information, really encourage public comment. Um, I mentioned that we're working in five different languages, English, Vietnamese, Russian, uh, Simplified Chinese and Spanish. We recently did a webinar with uh, live um, Spanish interpretation. Uh, I mentioned um, getting out there with community tabling events. Uh, we started those in the summer and fall when there were more tabling events to attend. Now that we're heading into the colder seasons, there's fewer, but we were at the Lentz International Farmers Market just recently. Um, and then a lot of ongoing briefings with community organizations. We have a full list of all of this available online to, to talk about um, sort of who we've been out talking with. And if uh, you your group would like to talk to us that has not yet, please reach out. So um, next slide. So how to comment. Um, so there's a QR code here that anyone can grab or the uh, website there, uh, but we've also um, opened up uh, ways where you can leave a voicemail and leave comments. You can send an email directly. You can send an email through the US Post Service. Um, but through January 6th is really the comment period that we're looking for. Uh, people to comment on, um, and uh, um, there's a, a few kind of key key documents and things that we're asking people to weigh in on. One is the project concept. We've talked with you all, the EMAC, uh, about the project concept a couple times. Um, that's uh, continued in development, but we're really in a place now where it's packaged, and you can see what what for the larger regional mobility pricing project we're proposing. The next slide. So, uh, what comes next? We're going to collect all the scoping comments um, and prepare a summary indicating what we heard and how how we're addressing. I think it's really important to close that that feedback loop. Um, throughout the NEPA process, we're anticipating an, another round, a lot more public engagement, a lot more um, uh, engagement with this group and with other work groups and committees. Um, all of this leads towards uh, the publication of the draft NEPA document, which. Uh, we anticipate in uh, mid to late 2023, and continuing uh, to work with the with our federal partners and our local partners towards approvals, 
uh, with intended implementation right now at the end of 2025 for the RMPP. So um, the toll rate setting uh, happens after the NEPA process. So we'll wrap up the NEPA process in early 2024, and then we'll get into the actual toll rate setting, the OTC, I should say. We'll get into the actual toll rate setting before uh, tolling comes online in 2025 timeframe. I think that is my last slide, but I'm, here we go. So these, the, uh, as people are thinking about scoping, this is really the question that we, we we're asking. Think about how the project might affect you, the community, the environment, your organizations, your agencies. Are there other issues beyond what we're proposing that you think we should study? Are there other um, ways to address congestion and, and some of the issues that, that uh, we've put forward that the project we think will help address? Are, are there other, other ways that we should be attacking this? So please, please take a look and um, we look forward to the comments. Thank you, Josh. So, yeah, oh, yes. He's still, sorry. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. Um, so um, the the regions in which the, the advertisements and information out went, Josh, can you specify, did those go to Clark County and Marion County and Yamhill County as well? Or is that Metro, Washington, Clackamas, Multnomah? So um, we we did uh, outreach directly to the counties that you mentioned, including the, the larger um, region. Uh, a lot of our work goes through Metro, and then we have a, a lot of representation in uh, Southwest Washington as well, uh, because because of the the way the, the area is urbanized, I guess, and because of, you know how much how much uh, Southwest Washington um, businesses and commuters rely on these routes. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, I would uh, I know we have some of the folks that are, are really involved in the in, um, engagement. On, online as well, but uh, we do have two full engagement reports from the two phases of engagement that we did over a year and a half available online. And they talk about who we reached, how we reached them, what methods we found were helpful, which weren't as successful. Um, and I think over time we, we've received about 20,000 comments from around the state. So um, in some ways it's been very successful and in other ways there's, there's more to do. Okay, so everything available online is what you're talking about right now. So if I've already read it, it means you've already reported on it. That's what this is, right? Meaning if it's already open to be accessed. So I read through a ton of recent <laughs> CBO interviews, focus groups, all of that is what you're summarizing here. Uh, yes. I, I, I have a feeling that you might be talking about the I-205. Um, engagement work that has been summarized wow. because this is this is a, we're at the beginning stages of the regional mobility pricing project, right. which goes to the point of that Eduardo made, which is it's confusing that there's two projects. So is is that yeah? Well, I, yeah, I thought this was all new there information. So Jessica, there are summaries online for what was done during the planning phase before starting NEPA. So oh. Okay, I'll just go back because I I felt like this was new information, but if it's already reported, then I maybe have already seen it. That's what I guess I'm trying to figure out what I what I accessed and what I saw. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. so there there will be another report after the scoping period is done of what we heard during scoping, but I think you probably read what we did during the planning phase. The other thing I'll add in terms of your question for outreach, we provided toolkits for our partners in all those counties that you mentioned and, and specific CBOs as well so that they could share with their list serve and um, distribution lists this information about how to access the information online and how to provide comments. And I think you provided some links to that also, Jessica. Um, we did, we provided um, the, the information about the regional mobility pricing project, the scoping information. So, and, and that's what we wanted to ask you all. Um, and Josh had kind of framed the question, if there's anything more that, you, that you're thinking about that will affect the, you, your community or the environment, are there other issues that you wanna look at uh, for the proposed study topics? That's the first part of the question. And then Rachel, you kind of were exploring the second part, second question, which is what more do you think we might need to do? What, what does EMAC think we should do around engagement for the regional mobility pricing project? So you might have some more specific thoughts about that, Rachel, especially having you know looked through all of that information. And we understand that we have a very short period of time in the meeting to talk about this pretty big topic. So we might 
we would we can carry this the rest of this conversation into a subcommittee meeting in January if you all feel that is necessary. But the but the, but just keeping in mind what Josh went through that we're in there in the scoping period. It's a fifty day cycle, and the the question is: Is there anything more that that the team should be studying? And if we and Rochelle, if you don't mind going back to slide thirty five, these are the proposed study topics. If you can take a look at those, and I and I believe that EMAC has influenced these. This is pretty comprehensive. So are there other topics that you've, what's missing? That's really the question. And Jessica, the one thing I would ask, because I do love the idea of asking the question today and letting some of us who process over time come back with, you know, some time to think about it. Yeah. But what was helpful in the past is examples. So I believe we discussed that, I mean, other communities have done tolling and had to do, uh, go through the NEPA process. So seeing those examples or those documents or those findings or those questions mm -hmm. to make sure we're not missing out something that someone else has already gone through and thought through, that would be helpful as a reference document or a few, if Joss has a you know, a way to get us copies of what, you know, whatever happened in California or back East or whatnot, just for context. That's awesome. James? Uh, I'm looking up there and I don't see a bullet directly talking about um, impacts on uh, the workforce and specifically uh, low income workers. I mean, it's kind of like sort of in a couple of those, but I don't see it called out there specifically. Excellent. Michael? Um, this may be included already, but, uh, you know, looking at climate change and safety included in that other bullet, um, really understanding uh, vehicle miles traveled, and if this project will support a reduction mm -hmm. in miles traveled across um, this, the like all transportation systems, so not just on the highway, but on local roadways as well, like getting at the, you know, uh, how it influences demand for single occupancy vehicles using the system would be like a really like core element, I think, to us understanding some equity implications and it's you know that's called out in our foundational statements too okay. um and then and then i guess related to you know transit use and reliability like you know understanding and taking a look at you know if if there are you know investments made into transit or made into you know good biking infrastructure and walking infrastructure and those kinds of things you know to the extent possible it would be great to understand the, you know, those impacts there. So these are great comments and we're running against our clock here right now. Um, my th our question for you then would be, do you want to make individual comments online through the process or would EMAC want to spend more time thinking about your comments as a group? More time? Okay, so I think we'll we'll carry this discussion into a subcommittee. And maybe what would be good would be to take the comments that have already been generated, edit that, and then come back for another conversation. Yeah, we'll do. If it's if it's important, I think what John just said here is what what you use in social science research all the time is establish questions that stay the same over time so that you can track responses to them. So it's actually really meaningful to use questions from other contexts again, because it gives us data that is incredibly transferable that way. Um, so I would just want to amplify that point. And I want would like to see that show up in a subcommittee meeting, too. Right. That would be a concern of mine as well. Great point. And again, we're running against time. So I just think think the next question will be about engagement and what else you'd like to see around the engagement process. But I'm going to close the conversation for the moment so that we can turn to members of the public on who I believe are online that would like to make some comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. So we have the low income toll report update. Do you want to do this and then go to low income? Yeah. yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. So, Nick, do we have some members online that would like to uh, share their comments with us? Looks like we do, Jessica. Um, Sarah, Ayanna Rohn, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to um, 
unmute yourself if you'll give me just a sec here and I'll put up the timer. Um, And thank you, members of the public, for your patience with us. Um, and I believe that Nick is going to pull up the timer to give you approximately two minutes to talk. And we're looking forward to hearing your comments. OK, Sarah, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself whenever you're ready. OK, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to this committee for your diligent work. There is nothing better uh, to James Bolson's point and your foundational documents. Uh, I wish you were leading uh, all of these processes for us because really we should be leading uh, with equity on everything that we're doing. So thank you so much for your work here. Uh, I am a member of RTAC and I have some concerns about how uh, the EMAC rep feedback has been taken, which I've supported. Uh, and I want to just stress uh, that because of your direct line to OTC, I think you should press hard to make sure that your policies are incorporated at that table and also when you are at the STRAC table and that's seated. Um, uh, your rep there recommended that the that the charter um, set prioritization across some competing um, concerns in the language of the charter where the goals of decongestion and revenue generation are set side by side and um, he had asked that they be prioritized often we know these can be competing and so i hope that you'll stress to make sure that those are carried forward i also want to make sure that you're demanding a clarity about authority over revenue spending as many of your members here said today uh, as we go through this scoping process and clarify what impacts we would like to have mitigated uh, and making sure that those uh, how we are going to spend uh, these precious tolling dollars are generated is going to be critically important i also hope that we can think about uh, some various types of equity in that um, you know, there's some modal equity they found in London when they put their congestion pricing policy in that there were actually impacts on transit riders and things like that. So I'm happy to work with you, talk with you. Uh, I just want to make sure that Emacs concerns are centered at that RTAC table. Time is running out, uh, but I just thought I would bring that to this group today. Thank you very much for hearing my concerns, and uh, you can find me at the Street Trust. Thank you very much. Nick, do we have a next speaker? I'm looking at the list now, Jessica, and no further raised hands at this moment. OK. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your public comment. Um, we are very close to the end of the meeting, and I know a lot of members have to leave. So um, Garrett, do you want to do a brief low-income toll program update? Yeah, I'll just do it verbally here, because this will be a topic we'll come back to the group many a times. Um, September of this year, uh, the Oregon Transportation Commission um, overwhelmingly and very gladly adopted uh, the low-income toll report, which you all had worked on that established really three kind of key pillars to move forward and guide further decision-making, uh, that there should be a, a deep uh, subsidy, um, free or deeply subsidized at 200% of the federal poverty level. At 400% of the federal poverty level, there should be another kind of targeted um, uh, subsidy or discount there. And that we should really look towards either self-certification or, or whatever is needed uh, in the verification process to make it as easy as possible on the customer to be able to access that program. So there's a meeting uh, tomorrow at the Joint Committee on Transportation where this report, because it was written into state law, it's now going to be presented to them. Uh, so that'll be interesting to hear their feedback on that report. And then uh, the team is vigorously working on a kind of a timeline work plan schedule on how do we get to that final program? And then how do we get that up and running on day one of tolling? Um, and so uh, that makes some folks nervous, but we'll get in there and a lot of decisions to work forward. And uh, so uh, some of your work plan lays out kind of your coordination with that, uh, but just know engagement, traffic and revenue studies, rulemaking, that's all a part of the uh, mixture uh, to, to happen to come 
And we're short on time, but this is a to- an ongoing topic but an important topic that will be coming back to the committee every meeting. <laughs> so thank you for that, Garrett. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Um, let's just go to our going forward next steps. Well, first of all, um, as you know, we'll be in January. We will be meeting for a subcommittee meeting. And then we'll also have a full EMAC meeting at the end of the month, either the last week or the or very early February. Um, so keep that in mind for 2023. Um, and during those meetings, we'll continue to work on the work plan um, and we'll bring everything that we were not able to finish with this meeting. So please complete your meeting evaluation and help us continue to improve the quality of this meeting and, and what else, whatever else you need for us to do to make sure that you're getting what you need out of these meetings. Um, and that is it. It's 531, unless anyone has any comments they want to share before we close. Well, one quick question. Yes. Are, are, are we going to continue to have hybrid meetings, number one? And number two, for those in person, will they always be here? Um, so, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Mandy, can you use your mic? Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I've got to get a little better at the hybrid meetings. Yes, this is the location that we'll have for 2023 and hybrid is our current plan. So, okay. And the subcommittee meetings will be held virtually. So those, um, and we'll be in touch with you about those dates. And hopefully everybody filled out the surveys to, to let us know what your preferences are for the meeting times. And if you haven't done that, please do. And if you have any questions between now and then, you know how to reach us. Um, thank you all. Thank you online. And thank you in this room. This was a great meeting. It's great to see everybody. Um, really good meeting. Thank you. Have a good night.